Okay, so now let's have a look at these profiles I already mentioned. So the, the simplest one is called GAP. This is the generic advertising profile. And um, you can send out from a sensor or from any peripheral device up to 31 bytes of data. And there is a, a, a kind of extended mode where you have an additional 31 bytes in a second packet available that will then be um, requested. The, uh, the other more complex one is this GATT, Generic Attribute Profile. Um, this is where you actually transmit data usually. So um, you can connect to one central device. You have uh, at least one service, for example, heart rate, and each service has at least one characteristic. In that case, we have pulse rate, for example. Um, and these uh, are identified by 16-bit identifiers. There's a, a global list maintained by this, this Bluetooth consortium, where you can look up these IDs. And um, as I've already mentioned, this is based on a published subscribe model to conserve energy. Because you can actually, for example, turn off the radio module in between entirely and only turn it on back on again if you want to send an update. So, how does this look like? So this very simple generic advertising profile, there's two variants. The one is passive scanning, where you have the peripheral send, uh, periodically sending out this advertising data with up to 31 bytes. And uh, there's also the active mode, um, where you can the peripheral sends out advertising data and the central then replies with a so-called scan request, and in response you get another up to 31 bytes of data. So you can, uh, if you really uh, push that to the, to the maximum, then you can send out up to 62 bytes uh, to another device. You might even be able to send out more data because you, this, in the next interval, the data doesn't have to be the same. Um, but it's just broadcast sent out to any device in the area, so you will have to be very careful about what kind of data you actually broadcast. Um, you could, can put just about any data you want in there, but um, yeah, again, there is no encryption at all. In some cases, this is actually an, an advantage. In some cases, it might not be one. But um, this is what uh, devices, Bluetooth low energy devices, use to, in the first place, announce that they are actually present. Therefore, it's also called um, no, not access advertising profile. That's actually a typo. Should be advertising. I'll fix, I'll fix that. Um, yeah, and on top of that, then for the more complex devices, we have the, the attribute profile, which um, in every profile has one or more of these services, and each service has one or more characteristics. And um, yeah, we have this published subscribe model where only in specific intervals the, the uh, system will actually be allowed to communicate. So it can definitely turn off the radio for the other, uh, for the other parts of that interval. Um, so just, just one more example of what these services and characteristics are. So uh, why would a device need more than one service? Well, a very simple example is if you have, let's say you just have a heart rate sensor which you wear on your wrist, then that might have two services. One is of course, first one would of course be heart rate with uh, pulse frequency and so on. And the second one, for example, might just be battery state. So that's also a, a predefined service that you can query uh, how much battery your device actually has left. Um, and because all of these are standardized, you can, at least in theory, use any device which conforms to that standard with any app which also conforms to that standard. In practice, of course, there's 
all kinds of, of little pitfalls, but at least in theory, it's designed so that if your device follows the standard, then you can use it with, with any app and vice versa. Okay, are there any questions, comments regarding uh, Bluetooth at the moment? <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so then let's continue with NF NFC. I've already mentioned this uh, before. NFC is also a technology which really was hyped at some point and right now isn't that interesting anymore. But we'll, we'll see that pop up again and again in the, in the near future, I'm assuming, because people will actually realize where it really makes sense to use these. Um, the devices itself are, as you can see here, really quite simple. You can get them for um, probably even maybe 20 cents uh, now. So they simply consist of a, of a conductive coil and one very simple IC. And the uh, basic idea behind any kind of RFID uh, system is that this actually doesn't have any power supply on its own but um, there is a, a corresponding coil built into your phone and a lot of phones actually have that by default now and it will transmit a very small amount of energy to the NFC tag which will that use that energy to power itself and reply back and so you can actually have a two-way communication. The one uh, big limitation is that this will uh, only work by default at a very short range of maybe two or three centimeters. So you really have to put your, your device, your reader device, more or less exactly on top of the tag. Um, the interesting part is how does this uh, actually communicate in the other direction? It's relatively obvious that the phone can generate an ele uh, electromagnetic field and put in some kind of modulation to communicate to the tag, but it actually works both directions. The tag um, can make minimal modifications to how much uh, electromagnetic field is reflected backwards. And that's actually sufficient to be picked up by the, by the reader again and have communication in the other direction too. Um, so, uh, just a moment. To get, get an idea of what the, what the tag can do, it's modulated uh, in 13.56 megahertz. This is a dedicated band. Um, the maximum data rate is 400 kilobits between the, the phone and the tag. And uh, you can have up to 80 kilobytes of storage on the more expensive tags. The really most simple ones have 137 bytes which isn't much, but it's still sufficient, for example, that you can put in a URL or something like that. Um, and there's actually quite, quite a different number of cards available. You can have the really simple storage cards where you can just put in a, a URL, for example, and then if you touch your device to that tag, then your device will open that URL. Um, you can also have uh, proper smart cards, which have their own crypto functions which have their own processor on the, on the RFID card, not just storage. Um, there's even Java cards where you can upload very small Java applets in a specific Java dialect directly onto that RFID chip, which will run on that chip then. Um, and there's also one interesting aspect which is called card emulation, which is not something that's so easily accessible, but um, in, the hardware that's built into your phone is more or less very similar to the one on the card. And so the phone actually can um, also behave like a card in some scenarios. So um, you've maybe seen that uh, more and more stores have contactless payment um, 
uh, appliances for reading reading cards, and you can sometimes you get uh, contactless credit cards, which you just have to swipe over the uh, the reader to work. And in theory, you can also do that with your phone. So your phone can actually emulate a, a credit card with the proper authentication. And then you just have to swipe your phone over the reader. Um, but uh, of course, that also opens up the possibility of to kind of cheat, for example, to uh, simulate a card which you don't actually have. So this is internally actually wired to the SIM card, which uh, uh, is the, the, we already talked about this, the SIM card is its own crypto processor, which you don't really have access to. So, um, for this to work, and I think this is also the reason why that isn't really widely used in Germany, the, uh, the SIM card providers would have to basically uh, implement that feature. So your phone can actually do the proper crypto protocols using the, uh, the NFC reader, and then you might be able to do a contactless payment in a store. But uh, right now, that's not something that's, that's widely used. Um, yeah, what's, uh, what scenarios uh, can this be used for? We can have, for example, just contact data in a business card or an URL. Um, it's very widely used, of course, for uh, secure, uh, so access control. Your Tosca card actually is an NFC card, so you can put it on your phone. If you have a, a suitable reader app installed, then you can read out some, some public data from that card. You, uh, because it actually has a crypto chip, the Tosca, you can't read out uh, a lot of information, but uh, some, some basic IDs, and so you can actually uh, look at on your phone. Um, passports actually mostly contain NFC, uh, devices now so that they can be read by, by automated reader at the airport, for example. And um, what's also interesting is that you can use it for direct device-to-device -device communication. So maybe you've, uh, I, I haven't seen a lot of people use this. Uh, many people actually don't even know that it's available. But if you have two Android phones with NFC built in, then you can touch them back to back and you can then use that to initiate, initiate a data transfer. For example, to send a, send a file or a URL to the other person's phone without having to uh, rely on something more complex like Bluetooth. So this is actually a, a very nice feature, but uh, only very few people seem to be actually aware that it's, it's there. Um, and in terms of these uh, scenarios, what's also, I think, important to keep in mind is that uh, even if the default range of such an NFC tag is just a few centimeters, there have been uh, experiments where if you use a basically a directed antenna, um, then you can increase the range to maybe one meter. And so uh, actually the data from your passport, for example, could be read out without you even noticing. Um, that's also the reason um, why some companies actually sell uh, uh, covers for passports that are uh, RF shielded, so you can't get uh, to the data in the, in the RFID tag without opening up the passport. So if it's just in your pocket, then even with a, with a powerful antenna, you can't access the data. That's at least the idea behind that. Of course, this is mostly a theoretical scenario. I've never heard of this actually being used somewhere in, in reality, but it's still possible. 